everyone. Uh, this is Darren McHugh with DTC. Want to thank you again for joining us for the uh, next edition of our monthly webinar series. Uh, this has been a great um, uh, venue so far to explore all the different hot topics that are related to the dental industry. Uh, and today is no different. Today we are going to be um, hearing from Phil Bogart. Uh, and he is going to be sharing with us a presentation about uh, the letter of the law protecting the goodwill of your dental practice. Um, Phil, I've known for years, uh, and we are certainly very lucky to have him with us as he goes ahead and shares his extensive knowledge with, uh, with us on, on the topic of protecting the practice. Um, so, uh, before we get started and, and do the formal introduction, just a couple of housekeeping items. As always, we do go ahead and record the webinar uh, so that it is viewable to all individuals afterwards. We know we do have these scheduled during lunch times, so um, uh, some people may not be able to attend, but we are certainly excited to get, um, get people on board to view the webinars afterwards. Um, so other than that, um, we have put everybody in mute and that will allow us to make sure that we go ahead and don't have any outside noise interruptions. Um, but if you have a question during the webinar, you'll see a little question box on your screen where you can simply type in that question and we will either address it during the webinar or during the Q, um, Q&A period at the conclusion. Our webinars go, we have about 25 minutes of content uh, from Phil today, uh, and then after that we'll do the Q&A. Um, a couple of ide other items that I'd just like to make sure everyone knows about. The reason why we started this webinar series is because we've been in the dental industry and serving the dental industry uh, for almost 20 years now. Uh, we handle all of the IT items, uh, HIPAA compliance, backups, day-to-day -day computer issues, things that, that, um, that certainly need a, a, a dental knowledgeable professional. Uh, we're different than just regular IT guys. We specialize in dental IT. Um, and because we've been doing so for so long, we've had a lot of our clients and uh, ask us about um, questions related to everything from HIPAA to practice management softwares to you know, expanding practices to HR items and, and um, financial items. And we realized that uh, over the years, we've gotten to know a lot of different people uh, at, that are working for great firms and institutions um, and wanted to share their uh, knowledge with the dental community. So uh, we've been fortunate enough to find uh, these incredible companies and partners who are just donating their time um, to share their knowledge and, and bring that information to the, the dental community. So. Today is no different. Um, as I said, um, Phil is certainly uh, an expert in the area. Uh, he is working with a, a, a practice in, um, they have lo locations really everywhere. Um, and he's gonna go ahead and tell you a little bit more about that, but he has been focusing on uh, law in dental communities or in dental practices and is gonna share that information. Um, again, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in for us. Uh, we'll get to that at the end, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Phil. Well, thank you very much, uh, Darren. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for calling in on a busy day. Um, you know, before I get started, I will mention that, uh, of course, HIPAA is one big area that affects all of us, uh, and I, I, uh, I deal with HIPAA uh, pretty frequently. Uh, and I've spoken to many, many attorneys about HIPAA. But I think the best seminar I ever attended about HIPAA was presented by Darren uh, just a few years ago at one of the dental uh, conferences, I, I believe down in Ocean City. Uh, so I think Darren actually is a lawyer in disguise. Maybe uh, maybe Darren is afraid to admit it, but he uh, <laughs> he's hiding the Esquire. Um, but that's what's nice about working with, with this company is that they really understand HIPAA, that, that – uh, many IT companies just don't don't get. Uh, but anyway, thank you for the opportunity. 
we're going to talk today about protecting your goodwill. I uh, have learned uh, throughout my career uh, about ways to, to lose goodwill, um, and many times people learn the hard way about how to protect the goodwill, and hopefully by, by you listening to this presentation, you can learn from some other people's mistakes about how to protect goodwill. Um, so before we start, I'll just mention that you know this already, I'm sure. Uh, goodwill is your practice's most valuable asset. Um, when you sell a practice or when you buy a practice, it may be a beautiful practice with, uh, with up-to-date technology and, and, the, and the best of equipment um, and a beautiful space, but at the end of the day, goodwill is, is most of the value. Um, now, what, what exactly is goodwill? There are many accounting uh, definitions for what goodwill is. You can Google goodwill and you'll see all sorts of definitions of it. Um, you'll, as you'll see on the slide, I mean, goodwill is an intangible value. But, but bottom line, goodwill means cash flow. Goodwill means patients that come to see you. Uh, patients that send their families and friends to come and see you. Uh, it's goodwill is an expected cash flow that that comes to your practice. Um, goodwill also refers to referrers. If you are an orthodontist or a periodontist or, or an oral surgeon or one of the other specialties, your goodwill is built not only you know, by your by your patients but also by you, the referrers. And so when you buy a practice or when you sell a practice, the person is buying goodwill or selling goodwill, meaning they are buying a certain expectation of, of cash flow. Um, and, and, and that's something that you have to, uh, to protect. Now, if you buy a practice, you're paying for goodwill when you, when you bought the practice. But you also will spend a lot of money um, developing the goodwill, um, marketing, advertising, uh, things like that. You should always be putting money into your practice to build the goodwill because if the practice is stagnant, meaning it's not growing, uh, that will have an impact on the bottom line. Uh, when you go sell your practice, um, the buyer is going to look at your growth. Has the practice been growing or not? Because uh, if it's growing, then they can expect a certain amount of goodwill. If it's, if it's stagnating or uh, going down, that will affect the, the bottom line. Uh, I, I represent mainly buyers uh, of practices. Um, I, I meet many, many dentists and dental specialists when I speak at various uh, dental shows and dental schools. Uh, in the area, Maryland, uh, Howard, and, and University of Virginia. And, uh, and because of that, um, I represent buyers, and, and we look at practices that um, have started to decline or stagnate because many times uh, the seller kind of gets used to the, the patients and, and is happy with their cash flow and doesn't really see a need to um, advertise or develop the practice. And so my message to you is keep growing it, never never stop and, and, and keep, it, um, keep it growing. But that's not the point of uh, today's talk. We're going to talk about um, how to protect your goodwill. Um, and that is what we're up to. And there's many ways to protect your goodwill from, um, from a legal standpoint. And specifically, non-competition agreements non-solicitation agreements, confidentiality agreements, employment agreements, and employee handbooks. And I'll discuss each one individually, but I will say at the outset that each of these need to be uh, crafted and tailored for your, your practice. Um, all too often people get samples from other people or they get agreements or, or handbooks from non-dentists or, or non-specialists, and um, they don't always work so well. So whatever you get needs to be well-crafted and tailored for your practice. And I'll mention this a little bit more in a couple minutes. Let's first talk about non-competition, non-solicitation restrictions. 
whenever I speak to people about this, whether in Maryland or in other states, everyone says to me, ah, they're not enforceable anyway. Um, and so what are you worried about? They're not enforceable. And so because of that, people sometimes will will sign them thinking that they're not enforceable or the employer won't require his or her employee to sign one because they say they're not enforceable and the answer is that they are enforceable um, and even if they're not enforceable to get to the point in a, in, a, in a trial where the judge says it's not enforceable can be tens of thousands of dollars and the only people that win are the lawyers um, and that, that's not how I like to make my money um, so if you have to fight a non-compete or non-solicitation to say uh, to prove it's not enforceable it can be very expensive um, and not only that, but if you have one of these in place, it can, there could can be a chilling effect from that person competing with you. But let, let's let's dive right into what each one of these is and, and how to make these uh, customized for your practice. So first of all, I, I apologize if I'm saying things that people already know, but non-competition agreements. What this means is that you agree that you will not compete with this practice while you're there and after you leave uh, for a certain number of years for a certain number of miles away from the practice now this applies to a seller an employee or a partner meaning all three types all these these parties should sign these documents meaning when you buy a practice the seller should agree to a non-compete when you hire an employee that associate dentist should be presented with a non-compete agreement and when you have a partner the partner should agree not to compete with the partnership while a partner and afterwards I'm going to talk in the, in, 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 within the context of an employee um, but it, it applies to all three of them uh, in different ways and I'll, I'll mention I'll mention some of the differences but anyway um, a typical non-compete is while you're employed and for uh, two years afterwards you may not compete within let's say three miles of it um, and so the, the biggest issue to be aware of is to ensure it's not too broad if it's too broad it indeed could be hard to enforce and people may be willing to take the chance and so it needs to be narrowly crafted um, if you are hiring an employee uh, you may only be allowed to restrict them for one or two years after they leave the practice um, if you're buying a practice where the seller is getting money for the goodwill the seller could be required to stay away for five years or, or even more um, now in terms of mileage it depends upon where you are uh, it depends on what when, depends upon what state you are. Uh, if you're in a urban area, uh, you may be limited to uh, just a few number of miles. If you're in a rural area, you can probably get away with more. In the Maryland, in the in the Baltimore, Maryland area, anywhere between three and five miles, in my opinion, is reasonable. Uh, every so often, I come across a contract where 10 or 15 miles is is required of the employee. And that typically is is just not it's not reasonable because you have so many dental offices in the area because this is a pretty densely populated area with many dental offices it's hard to make the argument that the employee would really hurt you if they go five miles away after all within those five miles there may be you know 50 dental practices for example but anyway, it should be narrowly crafted with your advisors to make sure it's the right number of miles. If you are a, a specialist, it's different than if you are a general dentist. But it depends upon state law. I know we're all in Maryland, but just to give you a sense, um, in some states like California and in one of the Dakotas and other states, you may not have these non-compete agreements. They are illegal. Fortunately, in Maryland, they are legal. But what's also interesting is that in some states you can get away with 20, 30 miles. In other states you can only get away with a couple blocks. For example, um, in New York City, if you would hire a dentist, 
you may only possibly be allowed to to re restrict them from let's say two or three blocks where if you're in Oklahoma you may get away with 20 or 30 miles it just depends um, liquidated damages is one way to to kind of quantify the damages sometimes in these agreements you have where the 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 um, employees told if you compete with me you're going to pay X number of dollars for each patient you take uh, sometimes these are good to have because they can serve as a deterrent against the employee and they can also be um, easier for the court to, to enforce sometimes again it all it all depends um, let's go to uh, the, the next clause which is non-solicitation agreements and then we'll come back and talk about some other tips about about both of these um, and so non-solicitation agreements these um, are are also kind of misunderstood but what this means is that while you're employed or while you're um, a partner you may not steal my patients and go elsewhere you may not steal my staff and go elsewhere um, if you buy a practice from someone the seller agrees they will not steal the patients or steal the staff which means they won't call up the the patients or their staff or send a mailing out saying I just moved follow me typically what they would do is they would say I'm gonna go five miles away I'll go to a different area and follow me to where I am now these restrictions if properly drafted have no um, mileage or, or geography type of restriction so the the document would say that the employee may not solicit patients or solicit staff to join them wherever they go even if they're many miles away again as I alluded to earlier the goodwill is is really tied to your staff is really tied to your associates if they are able to leave you and solicit these people they can steal the goodwill and that's why they're so important um, so this applies again to sellers employees and partners excuse me <clears throat> what what's many times met, missed and I see this when I review um, orthodontic contracts or um, oral surgery contracts is the goodwill of a specialist is tied to the referrer therefore if you are the employer or you're buying a specialty, specialty practice you need to ensure that your employee or the seller or the partner is not permitted to target your referral sources to leave the practice and then go solicit these these people because again that's where your your um, your goodwill is now I will tell you and this relates to the last bullet on this slide is if if somebody if your associate leaves you or you buy a practice from someone and they leave and they go practice outside of whatever non-compete radius if patients find them by themselves it's hard to stop the dentist from treating the patients um, public policy in pretty much all states allow patients to have a freedom of choice people should be able to pick their own health care provider and so if somebody finds the employee or the seller without having been solicited it's hard to stop them from from seeing the the doctor however you can still um, restrict solicitation um, now I like to go to some tips to keep in mind and and what it comes down to is ways to to um, focus and to narrow these restrictions and that's going to be key for enforcement and uh, and, and these are these are important both for the employee and both for the employer it's in everyone's best interest to keep these restrictions as narrow as possible so for example going to the non-compete many times the, the agreement will say when you leave you may not compete within five miles of any of my offices you certainly see this with um, the corporate practices where they say you may not solicit you may not compete within five miles of any of my offices and if they have offices all over you know the state that could keep 
the employee out of the, the whole state, and then the judge would certainly not enforce those. And um, if uh, if they have practices all over, you know, various different counties around Baltimore, um, they would th their five mile non compete could quickly become a thirty mile non compete if it's tracked from every single location. That's why I always I always tell my clients whether they're you know the employees or the employers, what the contract should say would be, you know, a certain number of miles around any office in which the employee practices um, or regularly practices. That that way it's it's narrowly construed to only the areas that you know really could be affected by um, the, the competition. Um, similarly, um, referral sources. Sometimes I, I've seen contracts for um, oral surgeons where the employee will be told you may not solicit any of the referrers of this practice. Now that's that's very broad. There may be you know tens of referrers, and so therefore what I suggest to be added to the contract would be you may not solicit referrers with whom you had a relationship. Um, and I would have a similar type of clause with employee with um, patients where it may say you may not solicit any of our patients. Well, the, the practice may have, you know, hopefully has thousands and thousands of patients. So what I usually put in there is, that, is, is a clause that says you may not solicit any of the patients with whom you had a connection with or with whom you treated. Again, we're trying to narrow the scope of the non-compete in order to make it more likely to be enforced and to make it more reasonable for the employee. Uh, and if you're listening and you are an employee, these are the types of, uh, of, of narrow clauses you should also look for. Um, if you look at a map and you see that you care about three miles to the north, but only one mile to the south, you can put in the contract that the mileage is not a circle, but it's uh, a different type of shape. Again, the goal is to narrow the scope of, of the non-compete. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention, which I think is helpful for employees and employers, now this would not apply to partners or to uh, sellers, but um, many times these contracts say that you know you may not compete within two years of leaving, and then another clause says that you know either party can terminate the contract with you know 20 days notice. And so you could be in a situation where the employee is there for a day or a week or maybe even a month, and then they get terminated, and then they're stuck for two years. Again, that's not it's not fair to the employee. And it's not really necessary, in my opinion, for the employer. So another way to narrow this is to say that these restrictions only are triggered when they're there for, you know, 20, uh, you know, let's say six months or or eight months, some type of of grace period, so that um, they don't get triggered right away. And 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 many times these types of clauses. Um, are necessary to make the employee more willing to sign these these non competes. Um, let's see. Okay, so so that that's that. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that if you're hiring um, a new specialist and that specialist has their own referral sources before this contract, you may be willing to allow them to keep their pre existing relationships. Um, However, I will tell you that if you hire a dentist or a dental specialist and they develop new referral sources on your watch, those should be owned by you. Um, they, should, they should not be owned by the employee. And so the contract could also say that referral sources that are developed by your employee while employed belong to the employer. Again, this goes to protecting the goodwill of the employer. Um, similarly, if you have an employee that maybe is younger than the, the, the employer, maybe is a different uh, demographic and has, has, uh, you know, has developed their own following of patients, 
those patients ideally should be owned by the practice because again the practice should own the goodwill and the way they own that goodwill is through these these agreements okay before we get to the the next slide I just want to see if there are any questions okay silence okay um, I think we're good to go. I don't see any out there as of yet Okay, there, that's fine. All right, moving on to the next thing. I, I see that I'm I'm kind of not running out of time, but I want to I want to skip ahead to a few more important of these issues. I'm going to skip the next slide and go to employment agreements. And I'm going to tell you about a about a, something something that just happened. Just last night, I had dinner with a new client. Um, he has been employed by a practice for the last three years. I hope it's nobody on this on this call. And he's been in for three years. He has no non-compete. The seller now wants to sell the practice. And um, the seller came to my client, the employee, and said, listen, uh, son, will you sign this agreement? Sign this employment agreement because I want to sell my practice. I know you don't want to buy it. And anyone that buys my practice wants to know that you, employee, cannot compete with me. So please sign this employment agreement. They've been there for three years. Uh, they have no intention of staying. And my client came to me and said, you know, should I sign this agreement? Now this agreement had all sorts of provisions, um, rights that the employer has against the employee. Of course, the non-competition, non-solicitation section was the most important section to the employer. And my client said to me, should I sign it? And I represent the employee, not the practice. And I said, I said, no, don't sign it. There's no reason to sign it. And so if you are listening and you have a practice and you have employees that do not have, you have employee dentists, specifically dentists or dental specialists that work for you and you do not have employment agreements with them, you have handshakes or you have emails and you, and let's say you're not worried about them competing with you, which I think you should be, but let's say you're not worried about it and you want to sell your practice in the next two, three, five, ten years, try to get them to sign an employment agreement up front. That's why I always tell people, get the contract signed when you hire the person, not later. Because once you you know kick the can down the road, it's hard to get it signed. And so the advice I have for you is sign that agreement. Now, uh, this employer in question that wants to sell their practice is, is in a bit of a pickle because they want to sell the practice and they have this star employee that has no non-compete. So it's it's an issue. Uh, I, I feel for him, but I, I represent the employee and I, I'm worried about him being restricted. But anyway, the, the point is, is get an agreement up front. Um, now, obviously these employment agreements have non-competition, non-solicitation sections, but they also should have clauses about the employee developing goodwill. Um, if this is a specialist, meeting the referrers, taking donuts to you know the general dentist, if you're an oral surgery practice, or um, you know going to the schools or going um, to to the preschools, if you're a pediatric dentist, um, require the employee to also spend time with doing business development and marketing. Um, you know, of course. Any cost would be paid by the employer, but I would have a requirement for the employee to develop that goodwill. In addition to that, if there's ever a situation where the employee misbehaves or does something that would reflect poorly on your practice, you want a clause in there that says you can terminate them uh, at, you know, when required in order to protect the goodwill of the practice. Um, so that's another element that can be helpful in uh, protecting your goodwill. Now, employment agreements are usually used with your dentists or your dental specialists. Um, however, your, your assistants, your hygienists, typically don't sign these agreements. They certainly would not sign a non-compete, non-solicitation. I mean, you can try, but usually they don't sign these. Um, and therefore, the next best thing for everyone else that works for you um, is going to be the handbook. The handbook is something that binds hygienists, your your front office people, your receptionist, whoever else is the face of your dental practice should have the employee handbook. 
that handbook should have a mission statement for you know the type of practice you want to have because ultimately um, you probably know this and I've heard this many times over the years many times patients or referral sources will stop associating with a practice because they don't like the receptionist or the hygienist or the, the other staff these people control your goodwill and the handbook is a way to um, you know have your mission statement and to create the ambiance that you want to have in the practice um, specifically um, it's going to the next slide it's specifically you know they're reminded they're they're at will which means they can be terminated at any time there can be a dress code in that handbook they a clear vacation leave policy email policy um, it's in my mind the handbook serves many different functions but but above all it's a it's a roadmap it's a roadmap for the staff to have to understand you know that their rights and their requirements as employees of the practice um, and going back to the prior slide um, you know if your staff is happy your patients will be happy if they if your staff is happy they are much more likely to provide excellent service and the handbook is just one of those ways um, to to help develop that atmosphere in your practice now obviously a handbook can't simply be a 30 page document that no one ever reads or that you don't really you know you don't really pay attention to the handbook has to be customized and and really tailored for your practice so that it really represents the type of, of mission you want your practice to have that's all the content that I have um, you know sometimes when you talk to yourself it goes quicker than you think it will so maybe I'm taking less time than I thought that I would but just a little blurb about my practice um, I am in a, a full-service law firm with offices all around Maryland Virginia uh, DC and, and various other states um, and most of my practice involves representing dentists and dental specialists as well as as well as other professionals in, in, in the healthcare industry uh, as I mentioned before many uh, probably most of my pay my clients are people um, that are buying practices um, or seeking their first job as an employee uh, and because of that I'm looking to develop career-long relationships with clients um, we help our clients with their initial purchase agreement um, employment agreements and then other things that come up uh, throughout uh, the, the the lifespan of, of a practice um, this is what we do and we, we enjoy doing it um, I've, I've gotten to interact with uh, with, with Darren McHugh and, and his business many many times over the years and it's uh, it's wonderful to to work with so many other um, talented service providers in, in the dental industry questions well, thank you, Phil. I, that was uh, incredibly informative. Uh, lots of great information, and and unfortunately, it's it's a shame that we sort of have to make sure we're always protecting ourselves and protecting that goodwill. But the reality of today is, uh, if you don't, uh, you can certainly get get uh, the, see the negative side effect of of not protecting the goodwill. So, um, I have a few questions here that have come through. Uh, let's see. Bear with me one second here. Uh, how does one uh, how does one prevent employees from soliciting patients elsewhere what laws prevent this that, that's, a, that's a great question um, if if the employee has an agreement which says they may not solicit then the contract is what you have and you have to enforce the contract um, by, you know by, by following the process of, of, of a breach of contract wherever you are um, there are laws however which protects trade secrets and other types of data of a practice and so if a, if a if a dentist leaves your office and downloads the list of patients or emails the list of patients to their own private email account that would be uh, something that that is against the law and that you can enforce that even without a contract um, but if someone leaves your practice 
and from memory just solicits patients, the only way to protect yourself is with this type of contract. Wow, that's uh, that's good to know. Um, next question I have here, and they apologize if they missed it, but again, what should you do if you already have an employee but don't have the employee agreement? So, so that, that that's um, that's a good question. Um, in Maryland, and this is not true in other states, but in Maryland, you can have them agree to this even after they already started to work for you. Um, I would present it to them. Um, and, and ask them to sign it, um, they may push back and you may need to do something. You may need to raise their salary or give, their better, give them better, better benefits. Um, you have to somehow convince the employee that this is good for them. And uh, even if it means agreeing to some smaller radius or less number of years, you're going to be better off having it than not having it. I can't tell you how often I've had a situation where we go to settlement, and I represent the buyer, and it turns out the employee who's at the practice has no non-compete. And many times the employer, employer will scramble to get that signed by the current employee. And I've had situations where the employer pays them $25,000 or even more to employees just to get them to agree to a non-compete. Wow. Um, and so sooner is, is better than, than later. Um, and even if you're not going to sell the practice now, if you have employees and they don't have these in place, try to get them. Now, um, they don't have to sign it, um, and you have to make it worth their while. I mean, if you're in other states, not sure if anyone here is calling from Pennsylvania, but in Pennsylvania, it will not be enforceable if someone signs this type of non-compete after they begin their employment. Usually you have to give the employee some extra amount of consideration to make it enforceable. Um, Maryland is not, doesn't have that same type of restriction. But um, you know, plan ahead and, and just realize that people care about the goodwill of your practice and you need to protect it and you need to have this paperwork that shows that you, you care about your goodwill and any buyer is gonna wanna see this. Okay. Um, continuing on the employee agreement question, somebody is wondering, what do you do for part-time employees? Listen, that, that's a great question. Right now, I have a, cl a client that is looking to be hired just during the weekends, every 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 Saturday, really, and and um, he sent me his contract for me to look at. He's the employee. He was he so he got this twenty-page document from the employer with all sorts of restrictions including, of course, a non-compete, non-solicitation. Um, I understand the practice's uh, desire to have that. From the employee standpoint, um, he doesn't really want to sign it. Um, and so, again, you have to kind of make it worth their while for them to sign it. If they're truly only a couple hours a week or only one day a week, you may not have to worry about it that much. But here's the issue, which I see um, pretty often is you hire somebody for, let's say, one day uh, a month, right? Or maybe maybe twice a month, okay? And hey, it's part-time, uh, they have their own practice elsewhere, and you don't get them to sign an employment agreement or you don't get them to sign a non-compete. And slowly, slowly, you have this part-time person work more and more and more hours, and then after you know a year or two, their full-time employees with nothing in place, no written agreement in place, um, and then the employer is stuck. And so what I would say is um, present the part-time employee with the contract, and you could put in there that this non-compete won't kick in unless you're working for me for more than X number of hours a month, um, but you want to have that in place so that if they ever become full-time employees, um, this, will, this will be in place. Um, but listen, if you can get the employee to sign an agreement and they're only there part time, and you know you make it reasonable, then I, I listen. I would certainly try. Okay. Uh, let's see. Looks like I've got one more question here, Phil. Um, about hiring independent um, contractors. Do you do you have a view on whether or not that's a good idea? 
Right. So that, that's that's a, also a good question. Um, it, it doesn't directly relate to the practice, though it, it you know it it could. Um, more often than not, uh, if you're hired or you hire somebody as an as a part-time employee, um, the CPA will tell the practice to hire them as an independent contractor. Um, if you're an orthodontist and you work three different places, um, they may want you to be an independent contractor. Um, it's it's it can be cheaper for the employer to hire an independent contractor. Um, it's more expensive for the employee because the employee pays more taxes. It can be cheaper for the employer. However, um, whenever these cases are are audited, whenever um, the state um, government or the agency gets involved, if there's an audit, they always set these aside, meaning the, the government never respects the, uh, the classification of a dentist being an independent contractor. I should I never say never, uh, to quote uh, an old James Bond movie, but it is, is very hard to justify hiring an employee, a, a dentist as an independent contractor. It can be very risky. I have a client right now uh, going through an audit uh, because of this type of classification. It can be very expensive because this is found money for the government and they can charge the practice all sorts of penalties and interest um, if they find that you've misclassified somebody. So it, it, can, it may not, it, it may be a little more expensive to hire the dentist as an employee as a W-2, but I don't believe it's worth the risk to hire a dentist as a 1099. Um, I, there are CPAs out there um, that disagree with this and 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 and, and do it anyway. Uh, and I and I've seen it. I've seen my clients do it anyway. But I believe you should always hire a dentist as a as an employee, not an independent contractor. Okay. Um... Well, Phil, I want to thank you on behalf of the attendees uh, and our team for uh, contributing your time. Again, this knowledge is uh, incredibly valuable. We really appreciate it. Um, I know that there are some other questions out there that we didn't have time to get to. Um, I would encourage those of you that still have some questions. Uh, Phil, is it okay if these people reach out to you to get some um, clarification? Sure, any anytime. Um, call my office or my mobile number. Uh, office number is 410-347-8710. Uh, or you can send me an email at pbogart at wtplaw.com. You can text me or you can call my mobile phone 410-852-9380. Always happy to talk to people about their issues. Um, I uh, probably shouldn't say this out loud. I shouldn't be recorded, but I'm not going to charge you for calling me if you want to run something by you. I, I, um, I'm happy to, you know, to to talk to you uh, kind of off the record without uh, uh, giving you exact legal advice. But I'm happy to have a discussion with you about any of these issues. That's great. I, again, I apologize to those uh, people who we didn't get all the questions answered, but please uh, feel free to call Phil reach out to him um, uh, and continue to explore uh, your, um, your questions. Uh, again, we want to thank everyone for attending as always. Our next webinar is coming up on November 9th. It's going to be focusing on accounting um, and end of year preparation items. Um, we will have that November 9th, uh, 1 o'clock. Again, we will continue to record these webinars. Please feel free uh, come back to our website, visit them anytime you like, gather as, as much information as you can. Check out all the other ones that have been posted as well, everything from marketing to wealth management to co staff compensation. All of those items have been addressed and more. Uh, we will continue to, uh, to have this, this platform. If there is a topic that you would like to see addressed, uh, please go ahead and, and contact us at DTC. Um, you can either call our, our office number or, or send me an email, um, sales at dtctoday.com. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for joining. Phil, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. Enjoy the rest of your week.